Greetings to you, my brothers and sisters in Christ. This is the day that the Lord has made, and we shall rejoice and be glad in it. I bring you greetings here from Friendship Baptist Church. On behalf of our pastor, Dr. Reginald E. Backus, our Sunday School Superintendent, Sister Frederica Williams, and each officer and member of this church, we're just so blessed that you are joining us for our general Sunday School lesson overview. As always, we thank you for your presence and your support, but most importantly for your prayers as we seek to do God's will and continue to share our Bible study, our worship experiences, and our Sunday School lesson overview weekly through our Facebook and YouTube pages. If this is the first time here, we ask that you would consider subscribing to our channel, turning on notifications. You'll get all of our content. The more you like and share our videos, Videos, the more uh, people that uh, our, our message will be able to get in front of. And it's just our prayer that uh, those that are struggling in their faith or that need encouragement, that they might receive an encouragement through the word and through the, the preaching and teaching that we do here at Friendship. And if there are by chance non-believers that stumble upon this page, it's our prayer that God will reveal his love to each and every one of you so that you can enter into a relationship with him through his son, Jesus Christ. Our lesson today is entitled Remaining Strong. It's taken from the fifth chapter of Romans, verses 1 through 11. And our key verse is Romans chapter 5, verse 1. In the New King James Version, it reads, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So our goals in today's lesson, first we will examine how Paul kept his faith while dealing with weaknesses, challenges, and failures in his own life. Secondly, we will acknowledge our own weaknesses and failures and understand how our faith builds endurance. And then third and finally, we will commit to expressing gratitude for God's love and the Holy Spirit's guidance. And so we thank you again for joining us today, uh, and we'll begin with prayer and jump right into our lesson. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day and another opportunity to study your word. We confess that we've fallen short and made mistakes, but we thank you that you give us brand new grace and brand new mercy each day of our life. Now as we break into your bread of life, remove whatever uh, is inside of us that does not belong, replace it with your love, with your wisdom, and right now with your word, that we might be strengthened on our walk. And for those of us that have not yet accepted your son, Jesus Christ, as Lord and Savior, that this message might help to water and plant seeds so that the love uh, that you have for each and every one of us will be revealed in its full glory. Thank you for our church, our pastor, and thank you for each and every person that's watching and listening right now, that we might be encouraged in our own faith journeys. In your son, Jesus Christ's name we pray, amen. Amen. So uh, we're in the book of Romans again for the second week. We talked about how Romans is a book of theology meant to explain uh, what it means to be saved, what it means to be a Christian. And Romans chapter 5 specifically talks about the benefits of being a believer, a child of God, a Christian. Uh, Paul in this letter to the church in Rome talks about how our relationship with Jesus Christ changes our relationship with God. And this gives us reason to rejoice, even in the midst of trials and tribulations, or what I like to call the hardships of life. Now, suffering is something that we all want to avoid, but by all means, we've learned in our own lives that suffering is unavoidable. Job chapter 14, verse 1 said, A man who is born of a woman is short of days, and his life is full of trouble. So therefore, in the midst of understanding that we must endure difficulties, trials, and tribulations, we should celebrate those trials and tribulations of life because they produce in believers a perseverance and endurance that prepares us to face the challenges that lies ahead. So our perseverance and our endurance is what we're talking about in this lesson of how our faith uh, is increased, is strengthened, is made, uh, is made stronger uh, because of the issues that we go through in life. So our lesson is broken down into four separate parts. We'll be reading from the New King James Version, Romans chapter 5, verses 1 through 11. The first part of our lesson is, it's done, now what? Romans chapter 5, verses 1 and 2 reads, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. So last week's lesson in Romans chapter 4 focused on the faith that is imputed or literally placed into believers by God due to the justification that we have based on our relationship with his son, Jesus Christ. This week's lesson follows directly from those words identifying how God sees us because of our faith. There are benefits of this new justification that Paul highlights in this fifth chapter of the book of Romans. The first benefit that Paul lists is that we're justified by faith. Our justification comes through faith alone. Justification literally means to be found not guilty. 
Now, if we look historically, the price of our sins have proven to be too much to pay on our own. The children of Israel in the Old Testament have the sacrificial system where they use the shedding of blood of animals as the payment or remission for sins. Yet they prove time and time again that there would not be enough shedding of blood to cover their own sins. Just this past week, I was talking to someone who had told me that they grew up a Christian, but they weren't sure if they were still a Christian. I asked them if they understood that they were a sinner that they make mistakes even when they don't want to, and they agreed yes. I asked them, do they think that they, in their own capacity, to do enough to pay for those sins, not just the ones they knew, but even the ones that they didn't recognize? And they said, no, that they would not. And then I asked them if they believed that God loved them enough to let his son, Jesus Christ, be perfect and die for their sins, and they said yes. And I said, well, you've just explained to me, or what, based on what you've agreed to, you are saved. And you can just see the joy in their life. So salvation means that we're justified or found not guilty. And again, we have proven that we're unable to pay the price for our sins. And so God saw fit to provide a payment for those sins or us to be found justified or not guilty for our sins through the sacrifice of his son, Jesus Christ. Jesus literally came to earth denied his divinity, became man, lived perfect, and on the cross took on the sins of the world so that we might be found not guilty because he paid the price for those sins. So he paid the price for the sins of the entire world, but we as individuals must decide to accept him as our Lord and Savior in order to receive the benefits of that sacrifice, the benefits of that payment. Uh, I'll give you a perfect example. Um, I was listening to Shark Tank the other day, I think, and the guy was talking about how uh, he sold an experience. I think it was the guy, uh, let me draw a cat for you. He draws cat uh, designs that were $9.95. He said that he made the majority of his money through a, uh, 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 Givlify, I'm, I'm gonna say Givlify, excuse me, a Groupon uh, advertisement where he partnered with Groupon because their logo or their mascot was a cat and he sold like 5,000 cat drawings through Groupon. He said the reason why he made so much money was that even though people bought the cat design coupon, only 50% of the people that bought them redeemed their coupon and actually turned it in. So he made over 100% profit simply because people didn't take advantage of a deal that they already had access to. It's the same thing that happens in the salvation of God. God did not die for a specific group of people or God didn't die just for church folks or just for black folks or white folks or brown folks. God died, sent his son to die for the entire world. By God died, I mean the Trinity, God, the Father, God, the Son, God, the Holy Spirit. God, the Son, died for our sins for the entire world. We have access to this gift of salvation for our sins to be paid, for uh, our, our sins to be blotted out by the blood of Christ, yet such a small percentage of the world takes advantage of this gift. And it's as if we've bought the Groupon, but it's free. We got a free Groupon and haven't used it or redeemed it. And think about all the gift cards that we've had that we've lost or haven't used. Think about all the extra change that we've just uh, lost track of or what we let loose in our uh, car seats or in our couch seats. It's as if we're ignoring the free blessings that are in our way for our own selfish reasons, our own prideful reasons, our own sinful reasons. And so God died for the entire world. And uh, we're found not guilty because Jesus stepped outside of divinity. He took on flesh. He bore the sins of the world, and he became guilty for us. This payment for our sins makes us justified or not guilty in the sight of God. It's why in Jude, only one chapter, verses 24 and 25, we say, now unto him who's able to present us faultless. It's because the blood of Jesus Christ presents us faultless in the sight of God because he pays the price for our sins. So the first benefit is that we're uh, justified by faith. The second benefit that Paul lists is that we have peace with God because of our relationship with Jesus Christ. So this is a difficult truth to accept especially when talking to non-believers because it reveals the truth of how God sees us outside of a faith in the Son, Jesus Christ, as our Lord and Savior. As hard as it is to accept, prior to a relationship with Jesus Christ, we were the opposite of at peace with God. We were literally at war with him. There is no gray area when it comes to faith, salvation, and, Christian, uh, and, and, and the Christian uh, behavior. All of us will pass on to the afterlife at some point in our lives either through death or through the second coming of Christ. 
In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 52, Paul writes, At that day, in a moment, the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumps shall sound, and the dead in Christ shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall all be changed. That change is different for those that have faith in Jesus and for those that don't have faith in Jesus. Those that have faith will be made perfect and created eternal. Uh, we'll gain eternal life. I, I said, we'll, we'll, those that have faith will be made perfect and will be granted eternal life in the presence of God forevermore. Those that don't have faith will be cast into the lake of eternal fire with the devil and tormented for all of eternity. So the peace that Paul writes about is not temporary, but it's eternal, and it's granted to all those that have faith in Jesus Christ, which gives us access to God the Father. It's what we mean when we say Jesus is the propitiation of our sins. His death and his sacrifice satisfies the wrath of God aimed at all of humanity because of our sinful nature. So you may not think that you're a sin. The moment that, at, that, that you're sinful, that you're a sinner. The moment that Adam ate from the tree of the fruit, the forbidden fruit, he had understanding of sin. He became depraved or sinful. And all of humanity born from the seed of Adam, we are born into sin. That means even before we come out the womb, we're sinful. Even before we say our first words, we're sinful. And the only way to satisfy God's wrath against that sin is by paying the price for that sin, which again, we've proven unable to pay ourselves. And so God loved us enough to send his son as payment for our sins so that we can no longer be sinful in the sight of God. So this is what Jesus means when he teaches in John 14, 6, that I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. There is no other way to be found not guilty. There is no other way to be justified. There is no way, other way for the God's wrath to be satisfied except through the payment of sins by Jesus Christ alone. We can't apologize enough. We can't repent enough. We can't tithe enough. We can't preach enough, teach enough, sing enough, pray enough. Without a relationship with Jesus Christ, we are guilty. And through a relationship with him, we are justified or found not guilty. So the first benefit is that we're justified. The second benefit is that we have peace with God. But the third benefit that Paul identifies is that we have standing grace. I love how Don Staley, the coach for the South Carolina female Gamecocks, the basketball team that just won a national championship, after about 30 to 45 seconds of not being able to contain herself, literally weeping in tears on the floor after they won the championship a couple months ago, uh, she said that God is giving us what we don't deserve, uncommon favor. We may not even understand or ask for what we need sometimes, but simply because of our faith in his son, Jesus Christ, God gives us what we don't deserve, what we don't even recognize we need. For many of us, as God continues to clean our lives up, as he continues to mature us and make us more like his son in righteousness, we sometimes forget that we don't deserve the blessings, the mercy, the grace, the forgiveness, and the love that God bestows upon us daily. The Bible makes it clear in Romans chapter 6, verse 23, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. This means that we literally deserve to die for our sins, but through our faith in Jesus Christ and through his sacrifice of his life by taking on the sins of, of the world, we are granted by God eternal life. Therefore, while we yearn and strive to live a perfect life and try each day to repent of our sins by turning away from our sins and turning to God, it's not our own efforts or our own works that gives us eternal life. It is our faith in God. It is our faith in Jesus Christ that gives us grace, affording to us what we cannot do for ourselves. Again, Paul makes it clear that the only way to receive the grace of God is through faith in his son, Jesus Christ. Finally, at the end of the second verse in Romans 5, Paul identifies that this justification this peace and grace that are benefits of our faith in Jesus Christ should produce a response of rejoicing in each believer. Rejoice literally means to boastfully be thankful. Hope means to know for what has yet to come. And the glory of God means who God is, what he has done, and what he is about to do. As believers, we should be excited about the evidence of what God has done throughout history of the church and throughout the history of our own lives. The Bible tells the story of God's love for his chosen people, 
Our ancestors tells the story of God's love for those that we know, and our own experience tells the story of God's love for us. This excitement produces a rejoicing, a boasting, a bragging through our faith in Jesus Christ we become excited and, and exhilarated to share and, and stand on that promise because we know it's true. It's as if we have Michael Jordan on our team in a pickup basketball game. We walk in the gym differently. We know that regardless of our own shortcomings or deficiencies, we have someone on our team that guarantees the victory. Therefore, our hope is built on what we know is going to happen because we can clearly see what has already happened and that gives us reason to be excited and rejoice. So the first part of our lesson is it's done, now what? The second part of our lesson is no pain, no gain. Romans chapter 5 verses 3 through 5 reads, and not only that, but we also glory in tribulations knowing that tribulation produces perseverance and perseverance, character, and character, hope. Now, hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. So verse 3 identifies another benefit of our faith in Jesus, that we will be able to celebrate our tribulations because our tribulations produce perseverance. Now, by tribulations, we're talking about the hardships of life and not just everyday struggles, not just my back don't feel as good as it did the day before, but I'm talking about when life really weighs us down. It's difficult for us to appreciate storms while we're in the midst of them, but it becomes easier to look back on storms once we come through them and identify how they made us stronger. There's a story about a, a, a teacher that was in the, a classroom and she was uh, looking for something to write with. So she pulled a brand new pencil out the box and she looked at the pencil and she said, look, I'm gonna have to put you in the pencil sharpener for you to be what you were designed to be. <clears throat> the pencil said, no problem, I'm ready to go. She put the pencil in the pencil sharpener, zut, zut, zut. The pencil let out a loud scream. Ah! The teacher said, what's wrong? She said, it's cold in there. It's dark in there, and I'm getting cut. The teacher said, I understand that it's cold, dark, and you're getting cut, but this is what you must go through in order to become what you were designed to be. One more time, the teacher put the pencil in the sharpener, zut, zut, zut. The pencil yelled even louder. It said, I can't take it anymore. It's too cold in there. It's too dark in there. I'm getting cut too bad. The, pencil, the teacher told the pencil, I understand what you're saying, but this is what it takes for you to come, become what you were designed to be. Finally, the teacher put the pencil in a third time, zip, 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 and the pencil screamed out, I can't take it anymore. I don't want to be a pencil. As the pencil began to complain, the teacher began to write, and the pencil finally understood that sometimes you have to go through cold, dark, and cutting moments in order for God to change us and turn us into what we were doing, designed to be. It's the cold, dark, and sharpening moments of life that turns us into what God has made us. The men, the women, the children, the elderly people that God has designed us to be, it's those difficult moments of life that prepare us for that. If David had not fought the lion and the bear, he wouldn't have been able to stand before Goliath, trusting that God would be there with him. If Daniel and the three Hebrew boys would not have stood firm on their faith and not bend it to the Babylon king, even at the threat of death or, or, or imprisonment, their faith wouldn't have been able to affect the Babylonians and the king and make them pledge their allegiance to God. Paul tells the church of Philippi in the fourth chapter of his letter to them that he has learned to be content in all things, in any situation he finds himself in because Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Now this is Paul who constantly had to defend his authority because he wasn't one of the disciples, who constantly had to defend his past because he once was a persecutor of the church, who constantly had to uh, found himself in prison three different times, people trying to kill him, arrest warrants, murder, uh, murder uh, decrees, uh, bitten by a snake, uh, hungry, uh, uh, without, yet he said, I am content in all things because God, because God gives me the strength to make it through. So Paul didn't complain about the situations he found himself in. He didn't ask God why was he being put to the test. He used those experiences to strengthen his faith and then used that strengthened faith to encourage the entire uh, 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 Asian, uh, 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 I'm trying to think of the right word, the, the, the Mediterranean uh, area of the Bible. These Gentile believers who were struggling in their own faith because they weren't circumcised, because they did not know Old Testament prophecy, because they weren't uh, fluent in Hebrew, because uh, they didn't understand the festivals. They didn't look like the church folk, and they were struggling. And Paul said, listen, 
I've made it through difficult times. I've made it through hard times. And my faith has become stronger for it. And God has strengthened me to endure. And if God has done it for me, he can do the same thing for you. And when we look at the example in the life of Paul, we can look at our own lives. That we haven't always had it easy. There's been difficult and dark moments in our life. There's been some things that both we uh, uh, brought on ourselves, but that we just simply stumbled into by no fault of our own. But yet and still, God saw us through. He held our hand. He he carried us through. He delivered us. He gave us breakthroughs, and he gave us uh, uh, blessings in the midst of storms. And so we can be just like Paul. Yes, I might have wanted to avoid those situations, but now I can look back on them and see how they made me stronger, how they made me better, and how they perfected or strengthened my faith. Uh, when, when our back is against the wall, when we don't know which way that we will go, when we feel like life is getting the best of us, it only provides an opportunity for our faith to be strengthened as we know that God will do what he has always done in our life, produce a victory in the midst of trouble, a calm in the midst of the storm, and a deliverance in the midst of confusion. Now, when you're weight training in a gym, muscles are strengthened by being stressed and pushed to the limit. As you push your muscles to the limits during the recovery period, they become stronger and able to carry more stress at the next time. The believer should look at our faith as if it's a muscle. When the hardships of life add stress to our muscles, God uses those instances of hardship to strengthen our faith and prepare us to carry an even heavier load as we move forward through the journey of our lives. This is not to ignore the impact of life's troubles on our morale, our mental health, our continence, our well-being, or even our peace. Believe me, I understand pain hurts, death hurts, sickness hurts, divorce hurts, troubles hurt. But we don't remain in a state of brokenness because God has indwelled or placed his spirit in each and every one of us as believers, and he can dry the crying eyes. He can heal the wounded spirit. He can calm the storms and bring peace to tumultuous situations. So the tribulations, the hardships of life produce character, and character produces hope. Now, Christian character is one of, uh, is one of faith and trust. We stand on God's promises, and our history with him grants us a hope that stands eternal. Because I know what he has done for Israel, because I know what he has done in the biblical record, because I know what he has done for my ancestors, because I know what he's done in my life, it gives me hope that no matter what comes against me, no matter what I face, I will have the faith and the strength to be perseverant, to be steadfast, to remain unmovable in the midst of difficult situations. I know what my future holds. That's that God will one day free me from the pains of this world and give me eternal life. So I'm able to weather the storms of life as I make my way towards the finish line. Because I know what the end is going to be, I'm not worried about the road that it takes to get there. It's why we celebrate the life of one that's passed away and went to heaven. We don't mourn. I mean, we mourn, but we don't, uh, we're not sad or, or, or disheartened at death because we understand if the person that passed on was a believer, that yes, we miss them now, but we know, one, that they're in a better place than, than us. And if we are believers, we will one day see them again. In verse 5, Paul points out that the hope that we have in God does not disappoint. Now, in life, we've become skeptical because we've all been let down. Even the most dependable of people will let us down. The post office will miss a delivery date. The grocery store may not have our items in stock. The flight might be delayed. But this is not always become because of intentional mistakes, but rather just because man makes mistakes. We're not perfect. So, yes, if our hope is in man, then we will certainly be let down at some point in our lives. But we place our hope in someone that has never let us down. Again, in Philippians chapter 1, verse 6, Paul reminds us that he that has started a good work will one day complete that good work. That's talking about the, the sanctification, the cleaning up process of God in our lives that he started will one day be completed. It goes back to that three-step process of salvation. We are justified the moment we believe. We are sanctified, sanctified or made clean for the moment of belief until the moment of death or at the return of Christ. And then we're glorified at that moment. Therefore, our hope is in the fact that we have been found not guilty and God has begun to clean up our lives to make us more Christ-like and one day we will be perfected in his presence for all of eternity. This doesn't create a love of God, but for all believers, we already love God. It rather it increases our love for God through the power of the Holy Spirit's presence and work in our lives. God loves us so much 
that when we take a step back and recognize all that he's done for us, we can see that he has poured out his blessings, his grace, his mercy, more than we deserve, more than we can recognize, and more than we can even receive. So it is God's Holy Spirit that guides our lives, that reveals the truth of his word and the fullness of his love and the presence of his power in our lives. This is why we rejoice. God puts something down on the inside of us and his Holy Spirit reveals God's love for us. So first part of our lesson, it's, it's done, now what? The second part of our lesson, no pain, no gain. The third part of our lesson is at just the right time. Romans chapter five, verses six through eight reads, for when we were still without strength, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet perhaps for a good man, someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrates his love toward us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So Paul then describes what God's love looks like to us. Without strength, Christ died in due time for the ungodly. That means in the midst of our sins, when we were still enemies of God, God loved us enough to send his son Christ to die for us before we were even born. Now, sometimes we have a problem with God's timing. God's timing might have seemed too late for Israel. After experiencing thousands of years of occupation and slavery, uh, Israel had longed for the promised Messiah to come. Yet his timing was perfect because it allowed Israel to see that they were what they were unable to do on their own to pay the price for their sins. Even today, as the New Testament church, God's timing might seem uncomfortable for us because we look forward to the return of Christ so that we can be free from the pains of this world. But as we continue to look from a deliverance of, from this world of sin, God allows us to become strengthened in our faith as he waits to send his son back. And he shares in our testimony uh, and gives us an opportunity to share our testimony, excuse me, with others so that they can move out of darkness and into the marvelous light from being hell bound to being heaven bound. So God's love extends even to the unborn. 2,000 years before we were even thought of, God loved us enough to see the sins that we have not yet even committed and pay the full price for those sins. Paul says that the best man might die for the right person, but we probably won't find someone who would die for the worst of humanity. Now, I would sarcastically say I would, and I would lay down my life for my family, my parents, my sister, my wife, but that guy that robbed me 20 years ago outside my dormitory in D.C., I don't know if I would lay down my life for him. Paul recognizes and identifies the limits of man's love, of our sacrifice, of our empathy. Even the most righteous of us, the best of us, probably would not be willing to die for everybody or the most depraved of society. Not because we don't want to be better or we don't want to be like God, but truthfully because we are incapable of being the best that we can be while we're living on this earth. But God demonstrated, he put on display, he highlighted and he lifted up his love for all the world to see while we were still his enemy, while we had no peace, while we were yet to even recognize the death of our sins. He loved us more than we could ever love him or anywhere else, anyone else because God is just that good. He's just that loving. It's one thing to love someone who we have a familial relationship with. It's one thing to love someone we've grown fond of. It's one thing for us to love someone that we share community with. It's even one thing for us to love someone that's wronged us, yet apologized and showed contrition. But God loved us at our lowest, when we were down and out, when we were sinking in sin, when we were rotten to the core. God loved us in a way that no one else could or would love us by sending his son, Jesus Christ, to die for our sins. So we've started our lesson. It's done now what? No pain, no gain. And we just looked at it at just the right time. The fourth and final part of our lesson is simply one word, reconciled. Romans chapter 5, verses 9 through 11 read, Much more than, having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if, when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more, having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only that, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received the reconciliation. So through the sacrifice of Jesus, by the shedding of his blood for our sins, and the giving up of his life, we are now found not guilty because the price has been paid. This not guilty verdict allows us to stand justified before God. Therefore, God doesn't see us in our sins, but he sees us sinless because our sins are covered with the blood of his son Jesus. We have faith, 
trust and confidence in God because of what he has done for us. And our response to that love is to place our hope in the hands, in his hands, excuse me, and look forward to the next move of God. That's how we are able to overcome and remain strong in the midst of hardships because God has proven that if he's already rescued us from the death of our sins and the penalty of death, then surely he will see us through whatever situation we find ourselves in. We rarely talk about the wrath of God, but these past four years have taught us that not only is the return of Christ imminent or coming at any moment, but life itself is not guaranteed and death for some of us may just be around the corner. God's wrath must be satisfied, and we have friends, family, loved ones who have yet to see the love of God for themselves, and if they die today, would spend eternity in hell. But God's love for us, it gives us hope. Our faith changes our character, and we become living instruments of God's love. And we are able to remind a dying world that there is a living Savior that can put that same hope in them. We have a responsibility to remain steadfast, unmovable, and persevere through hard times so others might see the strength of our faith and be drawn to the same love of God that has changed our lives. Paul makes it clear that while we were God's enemy, he reconciled us to him. He loved us enough to sacrifice his son to give his life on the cross that we might be saved. If this is what God would do for his enemies, imagine what God would do once we give our lives to him. He offered his son as payment for our sins while we were his enemies, and for those of us that are his children, he grants eternal life. Our lesson concludes, verse 11, by reminding us to rejoice. We rejoice because our relationship with Jesus Christ has reconciled us to God and opened up the door for us to receive the benefits of salvation that has been laid out through the first 10 verses of this fifth chapter. I don't know about you, but I'm excited. I'm encouraged to rejoice, to celebrate. Uh, I try not to toot my own horn, but when I accomplish something that I know that I've worked for, <clears throat> sometimes I can't help but tell others about it. Not to brag, but to celebrate the hard work and what God has enabled me to do in my life. This past December, I graduated from Moody Bible. This coming December, I'll be graduating again. I tried not to say anything. I did not even participate in the ceremony. But I found myself sharing more and more with people that were invested in me, that loved me, that I love. Because I was so excited about the accomplishment that I wanted to share with people so that they could rejoice with me. And we do it about our marriages, about our birthdays, about promotions, about new homes. Whatever it is that matters to us or that matters in the lives of those that God places around us, we share the victories and the blessings and the, and the deliverances, the breakthroughs. The most important deliverance, breakthrough, blessing of our life is the gift of salvation. And we should be just as excited, even more so, to share, to rejoice, to be bragging and boastful in, in, in what God has done in our life. We were going to hell, and there was nothing we could do about it. But God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son that whosoever shall believe in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. That means that God loved us enough to give us a chance to not die in our sins, give us a chance to receive eternal life, which we could not get on our own. And if that's not a reason to rejoice, if that's not a reason to brag, if that's not a reason to be boastful, then what, what reason do we have? I'll leave you with that. Look at everything you've been excited about in your life, a new car, new job, new boo, new house. And yeah, those things were cool, but eventually them things passed away. Got a better job, a better car, better boo, better house. But our salvation is the greatest gift of, that can ever be given. And if we don't tell anybody about anything that we've accomplished, that we've received, that we are sure about in our lives, why not share the gift that they could also share in, the gift of eternal life? I, I, I pray that my cousins, my uncles, my aunts, the people that are in my family, my neighbors, my coworkers, I pray that they all understand Jesus Christ and the pardon of their sins. Because I want to be with them for all of eternity. And one thing I don't want to do is get to heaven and realize I missed out sharing the gift of salvation with someone that I cared about or loved about. So let us be encouraged. Uh, be as excited about the gift of salvation as we are about any other gift that we ever received in our life. And watch God change our character, increase our faith, grow us in perseverance, and give us a hope that can stand the test of time. What an amazing lesson. I'm really excited about this lesson. I kind of just got a little excited 
preach myself happy, as the old preacher would say, uh, but God is just that good. Uh, we thank you for worshiping with us in your in your Bible study and our in our Sunday school. But we also encourage you to worship with us in our giving. We have four ways for you to support the work and ministry here at Friendship Baptist Church. You can give online on our website www.fbcchicago.org. You can give through Cash App Dollar Sign Friendship Chicago. You can text the word "give" to seven seven three nine nine two one four six two. Or as always, you can mail your check or money order to the church, fifty two hundred West Jackson Boulevard, Chicago, Illinois six zero six four four. For those of you all that have supported our ministry or looking for a place to give, I guarantee you we are doing some great work here at Friendship. We would love for you to partner with us and join us. Yet, uh, wherever it is that you worship, just find a place where you can support the spreading of the gospel and the work that God has called us to do. And God certainly blesses a cheerful giver. Uh, tomorrow, Sunday morning, I'm recording on Saturday, so tomorrow Sunday is our Women's Day. Really, really excited about our Women's Day. We have a wonderful, wonderful speaker, Sister Connie L. Lindsay, the Executive Vice President of Northern Trust is coming. Uh, she's a wonderful speaker, and uh, we're looking forward to hearing from her. So if you are the opportunity. You can join us live in person here at Friendship on Laramie and Jatson, 5200 West Jatson. We would love to see you at 11 a.m. We're going to have a small meal following the morning worship. And we're also going to celebrate the birthday of our first lady, Lady Detra Backus. So we would love to see you here. But as always, you can join us on Facebook and YouTube, and we would love for you to worship with us virtually. If you're looking for a church home, we would love for you to join us here at Friendship. Or if you're not in the Chicago area and don't want to worship virtually, let us know where you are. We'll help you find a place where you can uh, study God's word, be encouraged by God's word, and learn how to practice God's word in your life. If nothing else, we want to thank our pastor and our superintendent for this opportunity. And if the Lord says the same, we'll see you next week, next time, same channel, for another General Sunday School Lesson Overview. Let's end in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for all that you have continued to do in our lives. We thank you for your presence and the indwelling of your Holy Spirit, which guides us and reveals your love to us. Now help us to understand and recognize all that you have done for us, all that you are doing and all that you will do, to rejoice and be glad in it and to share to a dying world that there's a living Savior who gave his life that we might be saved. Now watch over us as we leave this place. Uh, we've entered this place to worship and learn, but we entered to serve. So equip us with what we need to face the challenges of this world. And let us not be shy or, or timid in the midst of trials and tribulations, but understand that whatever we go through is meant to make us stronger and to prepare us for what lies ahead. Thank you for this church. Thank you for our pastor. Thank you for our superintendent, Sister Frederick. And thank you for each and every person that's watching and listening right now. Strengthen us in our faith and encourage us to be strong in the midst of trials and tribulations. In your son's name, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. Have a wonderful, wonderful week. And again, if the Lord says the same, we'll see you next week. God bless.